So uh, chapter 16 talked about um, policy-based design. And um, <clears throat> I think we, we we agreed last week that we will split it up in, in two parts because it seemed kind of big, but actually after reviewing it and reading through it, it's the advanced part is, is really something I'm gonna touch on anyway. So I think I may just be able to cover uh, the whole chapter today. Uh, so policy-based design, what is it? Well, let's let's first look at strategy part. What is a strategy part? It's a way of selecting some behavior based on some some condition, right? For example, selecting um, how a socket TCP versus UDP socket um, collects or disconnects. So, strategy for UDP socket would be a no op. Strategy for a TCP socket would be an actually establishing connection. And here, I created a simple example using RAII, which we all know and love, to show you how a strategy pattern can easily be applied to something like, like RAII. Uh, and in the <clears throat> top code part, you see a simple structure on exit, and it's it does three things. When it's constructed, it accepts some sort of a proc, um, and makes a copy of it in its local private variable. And then on exit in its destructor, it calls it, right? So very simple. Stack object, you create it, you give it a give it a lambda. And when you're <clears throat> exiting, when you're being you know, removed to, to stack unwinding, you call whatever the lambda was. So we can use that in the next example you see to unlock a mutex in a safe way, right? Create a mutex M1, uh, I lock it. And then place a on exit stack object and give it a lambda that holds a reference to this mutex, which will um, call the unlock on the destructor of on exit. So we just code, we just made the code that's using it um, more exception safe because whether we return out of a function, you know, do a jump or or return from a function due to stack unwinding. Um, the mutex will be unlocked thanks to RAI. Uh, however, there is overhead to this approach. Uh, there is space overhead, and there may be <clears throat> computation overhead, meaning cycles, uh, extra code may need to be executed. Um, space overhead is is straightforward to see here. We have to hold a copy, an instance of this of this callable. So. How would we solve this problem with a policy-based design? Um, so let, let me first talk briefly about policy classes. What are they? Um, policy class should be a class that represents one particular action, um, can be consumed or is consumed by other classes, which can consume one or more of these policies. But the critical part when dealing with policy-based design and the designing of of policy classes is that they should be orthogonal policies, meaning they represent unrelated actions. So if I want to now build, for example, uh, a thread safe unique pointer, <clears throat> I could apply the pointer policy, which deals with how to release this pointer, and I could apply separate mutex policy, which you know, handles locking and unlocking for me. <clears throat> but those policy, as a, as a convention, as, as good design, these two actions, because they're completely separate, they shouldn't really be molded into one, nor should the action in one policy really depend on, on parameters of another policy. So you want to keep them orthogonal, so there is, <clears throat> there is good cohesion and there is no coupling between these policies. So <clears throat> that's a policy class. Now, how would we use it? There are several ways. First way, is through um, composition. So here, back to the RAII uh, pattern, uh, this is RAI1, <clears throat> and it takes a value of some type T and holds it, and it then has a policy, which is another type that's being configured, and it also holds an instance of that policy, and then the destructor, it calls p.close. Right, so, so this, is, this is some sort of a cleanup policy. Uh, T can be anything here, and policy can be anything here. 
And as long as there's a close method inside this policy type that can accept value of type T, you're good. The, the condition, the policy has been satisfied. Um, and there, it's worth noting that there's, there's a storage overhead to this. <clears throat> Even though previously I showed you the previous slide that the policy class doesn't have any members, um, but it will still it will still have allocated separate storage allocated for it as a, as a member of uh, of this class. Uh, C++ 20, I believe, uh, brings in a new attribute called no unique address, uh, which allows you to effectively get empty base class optimization without having an empty base class. Um, it's when you have a you have a, a member that's just a type without any other members, you can mark such members with no unique address, and they will um, they will not have any extra storage allocated for them. Um, and so then <clears throat> the way you use this, this type of policy through composition, you see in the second code snippet, I allocate a new integer on a heap, and then I create an instance of this RAII1 object and tell it that you will operate on pointers to int, and here's your pointer um, policy for deleting. And so this RAI1 will hold this pointer by value and also hold an instance of this policy. Um, and it will apply this policy in, in the destructor. Now, it's uh, another approach to solving this is to do it uh, through inheritance. <clears throat> and there are, there are lots of benefits to, to this approach. Um, first, there is no storage overhead. Uh, most compilers do you know, empty base class optimization by default. So as long as your policy that you are, that the RAII2 class is inheriting from, as long as they don't have any data members, that this will occupy no additional space in when creating an instance of RAII2. Um, the inheritance can be public or private. Um, my, my preference is to just roll with, with public, um, because it gives you an additional benefit of being able to, to decorate uh, the public interface. So when RAII2 inherits from this policy type, whatever methods that are public that are present in this policy type will now become part of RAII2's interface. Uh, this may not always be desirable, uh, so you can then <laughs> apply private, uh, private inheritance. Uh, public inheritance is is the you know inheritance of uh, of contract right of of behavior whereas private inheritance it's really just an inheritance of uh, of implementation details that's that's how you can think of it uh, let's see so again here the second code example I create a mutex m2 I lock it and then I create the instance of the raii2 I tell it you're going to hold a reference to a mutex and here's your mutex policy which the RAI2 now inherits from. Um, and in its destructor, it simply calls policy colon colon close. Oh. Um, another approach the author talks about uh, is, is through type erasure. Uh, so hey, Mark, pointer does that. Hey, Martin, yes? sorry, sorry. Can you go back to uh, previous to previous slide? This one? Uh, yeah, one back. Or? Yeah, this one. So yeah, instead of storing policy p there as a data member, you can can we do this? Just do it in the destructor, create the policy, and call the close. Yes, of course. That's you could um, you could create a temporary right policy, and then just call close on a on a temporary, and it would uh, right it would skip the. You would not have the storage over it. That's right. Okay. This is just one example, you know, given in a in a book. So I wanted to to show it and talk about its advantages and disadvantages. An advantage of this may be that the policy you know, can, can keep some state, right? And multiple applications of, of the methods from the policy can update some, some internal state. Yes. Some state keeping yeah. or whatever. Uh, versus if you just create a temporary and use it, you, you do not have that. You don't have that. But again, okay. state keeping can also be achieved by, by inheriting from policy. OK. So, all right, so um, yeah, there is a type erasure approach uh, and shirt pointer does that. Um, I don't know if I also talked about the shirt pointer, but it's a, it's kind of a, 
hybrid policy, I guess, approach, because it is it is runtime. Uh, it happens at runtime, but it's nevertheless um, an application of some policy that's provided to the shirt pointer, which is then type erased. And this policy in the in case of shirt pointer is the deleter policy uh, is applied when the when the last instance of the pointer goes out of scope. Uh, but that that carries with itself memory and execution penalty because a you gotta to to type erase you have to allocate it on a heap. Uh, you need to have a non template base class with a virtual method, and then a derived templated uh, class, uh, which where you can you know where you can inject the type and then and then erase it through this um, virtual public interface of the base. Uh, and again, there is the cost of indirection of having to make a, a virtual function call. So some notable examples of policy based design from STL. Uh, these are uh, the first one of the unordered map is based on composition. Uh, the second one in unique pointer. Mm, I think this one is also based on composition or it may just. The unique pointer key can be asked. It can give you an instance of a deleter. I don't know if it's. Um, I think it just creates a temporary and gives it to you. And similarly, in a destructor, I think unique pointer will will create an instance of a deleter and call upon it. So so that unique pointer does not get any storage overhead from from the deleter that it's using. Um, but a good example of the orthogonal or unrelated policies are shown in the unordered map from the STL, where you have <clears throat> three separate policies there. One is how to hash your key type. Uh, another one is how to compare it, right? And the third one is how to allocate the key value pairs. And notice these are completely unrelated, right? How you hash something has not got nothing to do with how you allocate it. And how you compare two keys has nothing to do with how you hash these keys and so on. So this is a good example of orthogonal policies that that one does not depend in any way on another. Otherwise, you would be restrained in what the class that's using the policies, how it could be configured, because if you suddenly pick some specific policy for, for the first policy, you would then you would then could be restrained to what the next one policy is, if they are related. If you keep them orthogonal and unrelated, this, this problem goes away. Um, then author talks about the advanced, you know, <clears throat> advanced policy-based design. And really there, uh, he talks about things like Consuming multiple policies, uh, which which you know you can you can easily see how that's done. Uh, you saw my example classes that take one policy. You can imagine just inheriting or having instances of two. Um, also, author does some some template trickery to um, like to enable or disable things in a public interface where um, one of the policy is just a simple true or false type that says. You know, true. If if it's if it's a true type, it will uh, then decorate the the class with um with a public um, method, which was actually the arrow operator, the, the pointer, dispatch operator. And if it's a false type, then it will not have it. So that's really that's really what I mentioned earlier, where you do public inheritance, you can decorate your classes this way. Um, also, it talks about some disadvantages too. Um, disadvantages of having these long names. Um, and type definitions say if you want to do an unordered map, <clears throat> going to create an instance of an ordered map with some custom allocator, you gotta you gotta specify all the other types too. You have to specify key, uh, type, hash, uh, you know, and, and equality before you can get to the allocator. So, author mentions this is this is a disadvantage, but this can be easily mitigated with uh, with type aliases, with type diffs or, or type aliases. Um, Let's see. And another disadvantage author talks about is that these these classes with different policies, um, they are they are they become a distinct distinctly different type, right? Because an instance of a template, um, say, a vector of of int is a completely different and distinct type from a vector of you know of long, um, and this can be disadvantage. You know, because it can give you this advantage if you want, uh, if you want these types to interact. But this can easily be solved by using, um, basically, providing uh, templated methods or operators. Uh, imagine a shirt pointer to 
int versus shared pointer to some class. And for whatever reason, you want to compare the two. You want to say, hey, do they point to the same you know, physical memory location? Uh, it normally would not be possible. However, if you implement your um, comparison operator as a template that can take, that you specify it, it takes, you know, left-hand side, it takes my type of a shirt pointer, and right-hand side, it can take a shirt pointer with any other type in it, and then just compare the, the raw bits of the pointer, and you can easily, um, can easily solve the problem this way. And I think, yeah, I think that's it.